after teledildonic suits and virtual sex, how can a girl keep up? A return may be back to the Gutenberg galaxy, to a world of a language and uh, of concepts, such as my training in philosophy necessarily confines me to. The work I've seen during this conference has convinced me of something that I'd already noticed over the times uh, that I've been working with uh, cyberspace, and that is that at this particular point in time, the practitioners, the artists, the people who are actually doing it, have a great deal more to say than the poor good old theorists who are trying to catch up with the developments in the field. If you look at it from a feminist perspective, in the 70s, maybe a certain kind of theory was determining some aesthetic lines. It was dictating more or less what art and literature should do. It looks to me like in the 90s, it's the artists, it's the performers, it's the ones who are actually practicing it that have taken the upper hand. And that's a very sobering and very good thing after years of post-structuralist philosophical arrogance for the philosophers to experience, to experience what Marguerite Duras has been saying uh, to actually the male species for some time, experience silence, experience the necessity to listen and to learn and to give up the theoretical imbecility that consists in attempting synthesis. All of this to say that I will not attempt any synthesis at all. I will react to a number of moments in the conference, moments that moved me, that stimulated me, that questioned me. And I will start with a quote from one of the great uh, simulators of all time. I think she was born a simulator. And I'll tell you the quote, and then you can guess who this is. It goes like this. It's a good thing that I was born a woman, or rather I would have been a drag queen or else I would have been a drag queen. Dolly Parton, a born simulator. It's a good thing that I was born a woman or else I would have been a drag queen. Now I wanted to start with Dolly Parton to try to picture um, a sort of a social reading of the kind of images I've been exposed to during this wonderful conference. We put Dolly Parton in the middle, and then next to her, that masterpiece of silicon reconstruction that is Elizabeth Taylor, uh, with uh, holding on her hand a sort of Diana Ross look-alike, Michael Jackson whimpering, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And then on the left of Dolly, we'll put the hyper-real fitness fetishist Jane Fonda with Ted Turner hovering very subtly in the background to the tune of Me Tarzan You. And then you have the pantheon of postmodern femininity, or postmodern feminine cyber bodies, live on CNN at any time, at any place, just from Hong Kong to Sarajevo, just push the button, there it is. Something about this CNNification of the world. And after this conference, I think we should turn CNN into a verb and say, have you been CNN of late? I've CNN quite rapidly. <laughs> Now, if we work a little bit with these icons of the feminine cyber bodies, and let's pick a few features to play around with. Uh, they, because there are features in common in, with, between Dolly, Liz, and uh, good old Jane. Uh, first of all, they all have a post-human body. They have artificially reconstructed, pump up body. And I think we've heard so much about different theories, practices, facets of the body during the conference that I will not even try to summarize, just maybe put at the center the idea that embodiment in this post-metaphysical, post-industrial, postcards days, embodiment is no longer one condition that rests on one specific com concept. Embodiment is a situation that we inhabit, and as uh, the, the work of the artists we saw particularly this morning proves, we should really learn to speak of our body as bodies, as sets of embodiments, as, as situations that we move in and out of. We should think of our body as a speaking utterance, as, as, a, as a performing set of, of, of um, actions and contact-making mechanisms. We no longer have one body, we have many, I should hope, and we move in and out of them at our own leisure and also in terms of negotiating with others. So embodiment is a condition that rests on this paradox of a proliferation of discourses and practices of the body, but at the same time, simultaneously, a loss of consensus as to what the body is. There isn't any. There are many, several, all of them. Now, you can be very philosophical, but it's too boring and it's too late in the afternoon, but we could remember that this loss, this paradox of the overexposure and the loss of consensus about the body goes back a long time. I mean, VR didn't make it happen. VR is the effect of something called the crisis of metaphysics with good old Nietzsche screaming, God is dead. I'll never forget the Monty Python rendition of that. 
God is dead and the stench of his rotting body will fill the cosmos for years to come. God has been very long in dying. It's taking a long time over it. But with the, with the death of God have also died a number of very familiar and comfortable notions. The security about the division between mind and body. The security about the role of nation, family, masculinity, femininity. A number of metaphysical certainties have actually given way to something more complex, more playful, more disturbing. Disturbing. For me, as a woman coming from a history of oppression and uh, exclusion, this shaking up, this crisis of conventional values is rather a positive thing. I will welcome anything that gets me out of the metaphysical condition, because for women, stuck as we have been to a certain definition of the body and nature, there is no way to go but up. So embodiment, post-human bodies, which I would see as rather a progress, as rather a step forward insofar as in the name of nature, a set of political moves which have hurt my gender have been enacted over century and century, so anything that can take me away from nature is more than welcome. So my point here is that hyper-reality does not wipe up politics, does not wipe up the need for political resistance or strategy. The, the world of postmodern bodies and post-human bodies makes another kind of politics more necessary than ever. And I would insist that we're looking at a radical redefinition of political action and not at all at a loss and a complete disintegration of political values. It's not because God is dead that anything goes. Just a yes, it was totally, completely wrong. <laughs> Second point about Dolly, Jane, and uh, Liz, they're filthy rich, disgustingly rich, because they're media stars. And capital in the post-industrial era is this immaterial flow of cash that harps on and trades in body fluids, cheap sweat, blood of dispensable workforces throughout the third world, but also the wetness of desire of first world consumers as they can commodify their existence into stupor. So hyper-reality does not wipe up class relations. On the contrary, it intensifies them. We have this paradox of a great commodification and conformism of culture, and at the same time, growing gaps and growing disparities within them. Second, connected to the filthy rich ladies that we're talking about, the omnipotence and the omnipresence of the visual media. I think it's been quite clear throughout the conference, the triumph of vision is a fait accompli in postmodern culture. It's all it's all about visualization, it's all about CNNification, and there is a lot that the, particularly the women artists have pointed out about how the triumph of vision is sort of a reinstates a sort of hierarchy of the senses, and maybe this triumph of visualization takes place at the expense of other sensory perceptions, touch and sound maybe, um, which have been often defined throughout this conference as rather under-exploited areas of virtual reality. Speaking as a feminist, in the light of the work of Lucy Rigaray, but also of Kaja Silverman, I think maybe we should explore the potentiality of hearing and audio um, material as a way out of the tyranny of the gaze, what Donna Haraway calls the disembodied satellite eye rotating in the sky. This, the visualization, the om, om, omnipotence of that kind of media is both a fait accompli, it's something which as a woman I have a twinge of worry about. The clarity fetishists who have turned CNN into a reality, those clarity fetishists are probably problematic individuals that we need to have a discussion with. Third point about our ladies, they're all white, and the whitest of them all is Michael Jackson. In his perverse opportunism, the con artist Jeff Koons, ex-husband of post-human porno star Ticciolina, in case you've forgotten, Jeff Koons depicted Michael Jackson in a beautiful white ceramic piece, totally lily white, as white as you, it's almost unbearable, it almost blinds you, and Jackson is holding a monkey in his arms. In interviews, Jeff Koons has explained this piece by saying, first of all, this is a reference to human evolution. And uh, like some of the artists we've seen in this conference, the pursuit of perfectibility through direct interventions in the body is something that Jeff Koons strongly believes in, anything from plastic surgery to hormonal changes, anything you want. So he actually supports Michael Jackson's campaign to turn himself into a lily white individual, because we all know, don't we, that whiteness is the standard of desirable 
incomparable beauty. Consequently, the whiter the better, the whiter the nicer, and the, the more efforts you make to get uh, yourself white, the better for you. Conclusion, postmodern hyperreality does not wipe out racism. It intensifies it and it spreads xenophobia at a very, very worrying rate. I would also want to say something about the Americanness of the three ladies in question, but I won't because it's too boring. But um, it seems to me that this, we all know, we are being recolonized by the American imaginary. We're all part-time members of the American dream. But speaking as a European, I know England is almost not Europe, but speaking as a European, <laughs> I do, I do worry about the extent to which econo economic metaphors about fighting off Japanese technology and American technologies actually get all mixed up with the fact that culturally speaking we are being recolonized. Cyberpunk is old time Americana, the guys who travel in, sp in space are called cowboys and I do worry about what a European version of the same would uh, look like. I make an appeal to you creative spirits to try to translate this into something that makes sense to my culture. But it will be a another issue. Um, now, confronted with this, with this picture, with these features, with these icons of cybernetic bodies that seem to me to reinstate powerful uh, power differentials and potentially um, negative strands, confronted with this, what can we do? Apart from declaring the superiority of the artists who are actually intervening in the field, I'd like to try a couple of reactions and see how that would go. One kind of reaction could be the bad girl's reaction. And it could go something like this. There is a war going on out there. Women are not pacifists. We're the guerrilla girls. We're the bad girls. We're the riot girls. We want to resist it, but we also want to have fun. But we want to have it our way. Look at the large and increasing number of women who are writing their own science fiction, a lot of them Europeans. We're sick and tired of VR technologies and cyberspace being toys for the boys. I am particularly sick and tired of recycled aging hippies who haven't managed to shake off their narcotic hangover from the 60s and are still pursuing it pathetically through computer drugs. Come on, boys, get real. Or as Linda DeMent put it this morning, a little less obstruction would be nice. <laughs> we women want our imaginary. We want our own projected selves. We want to design the world in our own, rather glorious, I must say, image. It is time for the unholy marriage of Nietzsche's Ariadna with Dionysian forces. Time for the female death wish for once to express itself, but in expressing itself, also work towards finding workable networks of translation into socially livable modes of behavior. It's time for history and the unconscious to strike up a new deal. Besides, I notice the metaphor of war is invading our cultural and social imaginary. From rap music to anything else, war is all around us. After the death of rock and roll, I don't know about you, but rock and roll for me died twice. First, when it was replaced by geriatric rock. I mean, will the Rolling Stones ever take their leave? Will they continue to perform? Are we condemned to Rod Stewart's never-ending yodeling? Will he ever retire? <laughs> The second moment of death of rock and roll, it's when it became a combat weapon by the US Army. This was already, of course, the case in Vietnam, but the coming out of rock and roll and of a heavy metal rock as a combat weapon was, was, was during the attack on Noriega in Panama City, with the, with the American Army using rock and roll on the poor Noriega until they drove him insane. And the guy, of course, surrendered, gave himself up. How can you stand metal rock or heavy metal for longer than five minutes? Rock and roll, the, the spirit of the 60s, the subversive music, remember all of that? Forget it. Combat weapon, thank God, rap has come in to replace it and to take its place, but rap is a kind of masculinist, warmongering sort of imagery that is also terribly worrying. And if you listen to women rappers bands like Salt and Pepper, then you really have to notice that there is a sort of a female rebellion within the rank and file of the new musicians who have had enough of the warmongering, enough of the violence of the images. The girls are getting mad. We want our own cyber dreams. We want our own consensual hallucinations. And what we particularly seem to want is to grab the opportunities that the new technologies are offering to actually get out of this old, decayed, seduced, abducted, and abandoned corpse of phallologocentric patriarchy. We're sick and tired of the death squads of the 
Phallus, the paratrooper of geriatric, militant, money-minded, silicon-boosted phallocracy, which, however, we're now, let me tell you, is doing still quite well. Let us use this technology to kill it, to disengage ourselves from the phallus with all its accessory values, money, nationalism, racism, iconic femininity, violence. As usual, of course, at times, at times of great opening ups and great changes when all of this could be possible, when a new moment of social political evolution could be possible, at times like that, the big bad virus hits again and nostalgia enters the scene. Frederick Jameson argues that nostalgia is the corollary of the postmodern condition. Everybody is busy bringing back nature, woman, the family, man, anything to keep the old thing from falling apart. I think we need to address seriously the, the paradox of this immense regression that seems to accompany the periods of opening up of great uh, technological advances. And here you could play with images drawn from popular culture. And the example I usually think of is the kind of reconstruction of gender images that are going on in the post-human sexuality of the cybernetic cultural imaginaries. I mean, the choice seems to be in between Schwarzenegger and the Videodrome kind of guys, between the psychotic uh, psychopath killers of the, of the Cameron films and the over-feminized hysterical males of David Cronenberg. I mean, some choice for the future of masculinity. There is a tendency, it seems to me, for the great promises of these technologies to actually get stuck and get stale down to very traditional, very familiar old story. Great techniques, same old narratives, as some of the people in this conference have already pointed out. It seems indeed to me that one of the great contradictions of cyber images is that they titillate the imagination, that they promise marvels and wonders, that particularly promises the marvel and wonders of a gender a free world or a multi-gender world, and yet, first of all, they reproduce some of the most banal, flat images of gender behavior you can ever think of, and secondly, they tend to intensify because they trigger off our imagination, the intensified differences between the sexes. Because I do think that the imagination is a gendered space. I do think that we have different imaginings and different longings and different dreams. I would quote Lucy Rigueray against Freud on this point to argue <coughs> that it is not true that there is only one unconscious and it is the same in both sexes, only one libido, and it is masculine in both sexes. I think that there is a multiplicity of unconscious and phantasmatic structures, I think women have their own stories to tell. Insofar as VR titillates our imaginations and disappoints it, at least as far as I'm concerned, um, it also re operates, reactivates gender dichotomies and gender tensions. I think there is a new sex world actually shaping up in the beautiful horizon of cyberspace. There is also an enormous credibility gap between the promises of VR and the kind of rudimentary flecked images that I have produced so far. In the short range, there is also a problem in that I think that this gap of the credibility will intensify the tension, the social tensions between the sexes. So I think we must return to the war metaphor and take this war metaphor very seriously because something is happening not only in the virtual spaces but in the real social spaces. And we, the riot girls of the post-industrial urban landscape, have our role to play in this. There is a lot of anger and disappointment in the air. This is not, uh, when we're talking about gender free world or world beyond gender, we have to account for something like this disappointment and this potential violence. In speaking about the post-industrial industrial lands, uh, urban landscape, I want to make a point about postmodernity, a word that was mentioned a great deal in this conference, and for me it's connected to this point about renewal of tensions and new power relations. Postmodernity, however trendy and meaningless it may have become, the postmodern means or indicates a specific moment in history. It indicates a historical situation of post-industrial societies after the decline of modernist hopes and tropes. You may say this is mainly a Western position, and it's true the point was made during the conference. The decline of the industrial Western system is a typically 
uh, sort of northwestern position. It does not affect the de developing world. I beg to differ about, about this. Indeed, it is a crisis of Western values, but what makes postmodernity difficult to grapple with and at the same time inescapable is that it is marked by transnational economies. Transnational economies in the day and age of the decline of the nation state. And part of a transnational economy is ethnic mixity. I mean, money has no race, right? An infinite process of hybridization of cultures. And this process of hybridization occurs at the same time as increasing racism and xenophobia hit our lands once again. It's about the third worldification, worldification of the first world, if I make up. Uh, that world, about increasing poverty and uh, feminization of poverty within the first world while continuing the traditional exploitation of the old third world by first world powers. It's about the decline of the legal economy and the rise, the monstrously, enormously powerful rise of the illegal economy. As Nick Cave put it one day, what is post-industrialism? It's capital as cocaine. It's capital as weapon trade money. It's capital as, as money your prostitution and trade in women. It's that sort of capital that good old Karl Marx, may he rest in peace, had not imagined possible. It's about having realized that capitalism is going nowhere, that there is no ideological purpose. It's a machine balanced on self-perpetuation. It's what Deleuze says, capitalism as schizophrenia. This is the postmodern place, and in a postmodern urban landscape, there are some things that the riot girls or the bad girls can actually pick on. The space of the city, I was very struck by how London had changed in the five years since I hadn't seen it, cleaned up by post-industrial metal and plexiglass buildings, like a mask that covers up the putrefaction of the old industrial space, the death of the modernist dream. It is an, almost like an atrociously immoral push towards progress at all costs. The post-industrial system has neglected to stop and mourn the death of modernism. We are launching on towards a fake future without taking the time for the ceremony, for the ritual of burying the dead. It seems to me that the most moral beings when it comes to the death of modernism are the science fiction writers, those who actually linger on the death and they take the time to strip the veneer of post-industrial plastic surgery that covers up the face of our cities. And they are science fiction writers that are putting death back at the center of the agenda. But also, I agree, not only science fiction writers, but a lot of electronic artists, a lot of cyber artists who are lingering on the need to ritualize a moment of transition and not launch headlong into it. Death and the ritual of burning the body, dissolving it, relinquishing it. This is a, a theme that if you've read cyberpunk novels, is everywhere in them. As um, Sadie Plant and some of the other speakers in the conference have pointed out, it's about the longing for relinquishing into the matrix. Now, cyberpunk, we all know, is a very male-dominated genre, and it reflects the male fantasy of dissolution into the body of higher cosmic forces. I see it as a little boy's final climactic return back into Big Mama's organic and forever expanding container. So soft, so sloppy, so essentialistic, so tender. Carol Gilligan would love it. We, the riot girls, who have been persecuted, hassled, and repressed by Big Mama all our life, we who had to fight Big Mama off our backs, chase her out of the dark recesses of our psyche. Don't forget that when Virginia Woolf said, kill the angel in the house, she meant the nurturing, caring, wishy, softy, wafty, vanilla, horrible, <laughs> maternal blob. We cannot share this fantasy of return to the matrix, if anything. We want to get out of it as fast as we can. We want our own dreams of dissolving into cosmic dimensions of our own. Keep your, you can keep your matrix stuff. All I need is a hammer to smash it once and for all. Your death wish is not my death wish, so you better give us, me, my gender, the space and time to negotiate and develop it for myself. And if you don't, I'm going to get real mad and decide to enact in the real everyday life your worst fantasies and expectations of just how obnoxious a girl can be. To quote another great simulator, Bette Midler, I'm everything you were afraid your little girl would grow up to be, and your little boy as well. Yeah. 
Now, in arguing for this, um, I, but I will skip it because it's starting to too theoretical, I am making a very strong claim, which I could substantiate if we had six months, about uh, the, the nature of sexual difference and the extent to which the, the claim of a different, to a different symbolic order has become a leitmotif in contemporary psychoanalysis and also in the kind of philosophy that I practice, be it in the case of Gilles Deleuze or of Lucie Vigare. But while we go on, with this idea that there is a, a massive shift in our gender uh, division of labor and our gender imagining, let's just remember one of the most important, in my opinion, challenging insights that feminism has given us, at least in the West. And it was the idea that what we call gender is in fact a totally dissymmetrical division of labor. It's a division of labor that in fact confines the women to the body, confines the women to embodiment, and frees the man it frees the male species from the body because they get to carry the phallus and be the universal referent of the subject. It's a horrible thing. I'm not saying it's particularly good to be stuck with the phallus, but it's phallus, but it is a different position. It's a different division of labor. It seems to me that there is this danger of the flight from the body, as Sadie Plant put it um, yesterday. There's a danger of reinstating the good old-fashioned masculine tendency to fly away from embodiment and to call that a liberating and freeing experience. As a member of a gender that was confined to the body, I would rather see progress in the shape of men learning to re-embody themselves. The radical incarnation that Wim Wenders explains so beautifully in his film, The Angels of Berlin. Remember when they have to drop, the angels have to drop to earth and enter the body? The pain of actually being inside the body, of being real, of being grounded. It seems to me that that experience, the pain of embodiment, of being not man as the referent of universal subjectivity, but being a man, one, in a male body, that pain is something that we need to confront and we need to talk about if we are going to renegotiate gender boundaries in a truly, genuinely freeing and innovative manner. When I read some of the stuff that is being written in the cyber literature, I wonder whether this is the direction that things are taking. Now, rapidly, for as far as the claim of women is concerned, against the reductive psychology that is very often expressed in the cyber technology, the idea that we can overstep the body or fly away from it, I would like to stress the point that with the death of God and the death of man, woman died too. Woman, as the institution of the eternal feminine, is one of the great pillars on which the patriarchal system had erected itself. And that woman, as institution and as a representation, the woman about whom Virginia Woolf said, we are the most studied animal in the world. The museums are full of us. The woman as the general manager of patriarchy, that woman has also historically declined. And the women of today, particularly the cyber feminists, are post-woman women. They are women who come after the decline of eternal, essentialized femininity. And because of this, the relationship that the women of today entertain with woman is in itself a project, an open issue. It's as if many of the artists and thinkers that we've heard through the conference entertain their own relationship to something that you could call female embodiment, female identity, female genealogies. For me, identity is about memory, hence my question this morning about time. It's about a data bank of memories, of sensory perceptions. It's about genealogies. And that kind of memory requires frequent revisitations and repetitions in order to be activated. So before we plunge into euphoric celebrations of a post-gendered world, let us consider the extent to which our bodies, our physical embodiments, are data bank of memories, of traces, most of them unconscious, most of them half forgotten, that you cannot slot in and out like you do inside the hardware. I think one of the most pernicious images that we've had to live with for the last 10 years is the idea that there is 
a computer with a hardware and then there is a software and you slot the software into the hardware and you get the intelligence, the memory. Now, if anything, VR technology and cyberspace and explorers have proved to us that there is a third category, that there is the hardware, there is the software, and then there is the human agent. And the word that I have heard quoted to describe the human agent is wetware. We are wet, we have a body, we have body fluids, we sweat, we cry, we ejaculate, we, we get wet. The wetness of the human body is something that we need to bring in as another source of human intelligence to break up the absolutely reductive Cartesian couple of the mind and the body, the software and the hardware. And because of this idea of identity as a memory and the body has sensible, sensitive matter, I think that the way to try to negotiate our deals with cyber technology and the new cyber world is through patient and careful experiments with repetitions. I call this that the only answer, I said that the only answer to metaphysics is metabolism, repetition, consumption, revisiting the old site, almost like working backwards through things which we've all been familiar with, including gender identity, including the fact that we go on calling ourselves men and women, whatever that may mean. Care for repetition, the new can only be engendered through careful repetition of the, of the old. Or to speak like, like Freud, we need rituals of burial and mourning of the dead. We need totemic meals to assimilate the old and the dead, to take the time to ritualize the transition before we can go on to actually invent the new. You do not invent the new through solipsistic fantasy flights. You don't invent the new through self-naming. You invent the new through patient repetitions, revisitation, sifting through what has been the best of the old culture, keeping what we can, and more importantly, talking about it. We need workable social discussions about all these new forms of representation and technology. We need at least a quest for consensus. We need complexity, multiplicity, simultaneity, but we need to rethink gender, class and race in the pursuit of complexity, multiplicity, simultaneity of relations. More than anything else, I think that at this point in time, we need gentleness, compassion, a sort of softness of touch, a lightness of touch, I would say even humor, in order to pull through the ruptures and the raptures of our times. Cyber feminists need to cultivate a culture of joy and affirmation. Remember the days when feminism had a beat and you could dance to it? Women have danced through a variety of formidable and potentially lethal minefields in their long history. I think we need to dance through this one too, if only to make sure that the joysticks of the cyberspace cowboys will not repropose felicity under the mask of multiplicity, if only to make sure that the riot girls, in their anger and their passion, will not recreate law and order under the cover of a triumphant femininity. We need irony and self-scrutiny. As the manifesto of the bad girls put it, through laughter, our anger will become a tool of liberation. And in the hope that the laugh will not be on us, we hope that our collectively negotiated Dionysian laughter will indeed bury it all. And once and for all, it? Asked Alice in Wonderland. What do you mean, it? Bury it all. What is it? What shape is it? Am I it? In her text, In Memoriam to Identity, Kathy Acker answers, I have my identity and I have my sex. I'm it, all right. I'm still it. Because for as long as I have my identity and my sex, I'm it. I'm not new yet. For as long as I has his, her identity and his, her own sex, I is not you, new yet. For as long as you believe in grammar, you believe in God, and though the stench of his rotting corpse has been filling the Western world for over a century now, it will take more than hysterical experiments with bad syntax or solipsistic fantasy games to get us all collectively out of his decayed and nonetheless ever so operational phallogocentric madness.
much as I regret to say it, Jeff Koons is right. There is evidence that the human organism adapts. I mean, the, when people took the first train ride, everybody was sick because it was so fast, like 20 kilometers an hour. And, uh, the first the bullet trains, the people who went on the fast trains, it was the same reaction. And then you adapt. I think there is, in fact, is the argument of a great deal of, uh, of the, what should we call them, the cyber cyber bioengineers who said we need to have our, our bioorganism adapting and speeding it up and and uh, and getting um, getting it better you know, or better performing anyway I think that's uh, fair enough as an ideal so long as the point I was trying to make is that we negotiate the shifts and the transitions uh, carefully that we don't plunge into this as if it were as simple as peeling off a skin I don't think you shift human perception and human uh, perceptory history um, overnight or in, in one second. And I'm afraid that, that we're plunging headlong into a recipe for um, schizophrenia, um, basically. Um, but I'm not very well suited. I can only theorize about this. I don't have a practice of it. Only one other point, that the evidence of the work of this conference is that there is an enormous amount of exploration of other sights, of other senses than the sight, the tactile, the, the, the touching, the, the, the actually hearing, that there is a real revolution in the hierarchy of the senses. And that would be a very interesting thing to pursue, because I'm afraid the triumph of gaze, uh, as sight, as uh, the king of the senses, that's here to stay. I think historically there's nothing we can do about it. We are the culture of technology, and that's because we are the culture that has invested in sight. Um, so that's the point of no return. Let's just try to broaden it up and make the most of it, really. One small problem is the human imagination is extremely limited. In my experience with fantasy, is that uh, the only limitation is our great poverty of them. You just try for one week to write down all of your erotic fantasies. The very standard feminist homework exercise. You know, women say, "Go home and you write your sexual fantasies for a week." You will start admiring Le Marquis de Sade for the great wealth of imagination that you have. Just. The poverty of, of the sexual codes that we have in this little porno movie between our ears is appalling. So uh, the limitation will indeed be not so much the technology, but the wetware that is trying to use it. I mean, the wetware. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that it's up to the theoreticians to keep up, um, to catch up with the, the practice. Is this working? Yeah. This okay. Um, but there's one area in which I think that the... Um, the theory is perhaps ahead of the practice. And this goes back to one thing that Joan, Joan Truckenbroad said yesterday about um, interfacing versus interrelationships. Um, she mentioned that she was tired in a way of, of hearing interfacing being the, the, the main concern. And she was more concerned with this idea of interrelating through cyberspace and virtual reality. And this is related to perhaps the limitation in, in VR to do with, as you said, the, the tactile and, and the, um, the audio as, as opposed to just the visual. My concern is just that if we have a call to violence, a call to arms in a way, a call to, to riot, without sufficient guarantees that there's, there's adequate interrelation between um, people in, in cyberspace, my fear is that the the subject will still win out and that our call to arms will be far more destructive than, than we thought it would be. And instead of being destructive of subjectivity, it would be destructive of the subjects who are actually involved in the, the battle, as it were. So I was wondering what you thought about that, whether in a way that the practice has to catch up with the theory to prevent um, excessive bloodshed. Interesting question. I'll need uh, six years to answer it. And um, just um, reacting just off the top of my head, when I said that there is um, an advance of the, uh, said the practitioners over the theorists, it's because precisely on the extent to which you can be aware of which, what boundaries are being shifted. I think that a, a, a lot of us who are working within the bastion of phallologosentrism, which is a language, since, ever since Nietzsche, we've been trying to say we need new representations for the subject of modernity, and then the subject of postmodernity, and then the subject of posthumanity. We've been talking about conceptual creativity for 150 years, the need to redesign. I mean, Freud was talking about good old Karl, may he rest in peace, was talking about. And it is excessively difficult to do so in the medium of language with a history of 2,000 years of conceptual domination behind you. So when a theorist approaches 
these technologies, we bring in these expectations along with us. And, it's, and the people who are doing the technologies come into them from a totally different angle with much more limited scope and sometimes downright commercial interests which limit necessarily the application. So there is a sort of a cacophony going on. The people are bringing in different expectations which makes the dialogue and the social discussion about it very, very difficult. So I wouldn't restrict necessarily intersubjectivity to the theories. I think that a great deal of cyberspace explorers, I heard John Barlow in an interview saying, after two hours of, of you know, VR, you're so glad to get off the machine and go, you know, relate to the grass, which means it's the California slang for taking your shoes off and walking barefooted, you're relating to the grass, and listen to the trees or whatever, the birds, <laughs> and be in real nature. There is a sense in which VR makes it more necessary for you to have good old-fashioned metaphysics of substance contacts. <laughs> and it's, uh, for instance, something about which I certainly wouldn't have thought about. So I wouldn't restrict intersubjectivity to the theorists, but I think that we are coming from very different disciplinary backgrounds and we bring different expectations to the actual medium. Um, and the only way out of it is to actually have dialogues, to just talk about you know, what would we expect from this? What could this thing do for us? For me, it could enact a Dionysian liberation of affirmative, joyful, new subjectivities. And I mean, most people look at me saying, what? <laughs> and you mean, uh, uh, there, is, there is different idioms. I think Donna Haraway puts it nicely. She says, in order to hold the social debate about the new technologies, we need multiple uh, literacies. We need to speak many different languages. We need to compare notes. Um, I am not pessimistic about the fact that theorists are behind. I think theorists need to learn different idioms. Um, and I think that we need to lose some of the arrogance. But at the same time, I do get distressed about the, the low level of literacy of some of the practitioners. Not the case in this conference, obviously. Uh, but I, I would sort of negotiate a new deal. I really think a new, a new deal. Um, but it would be horrible if the theorists had to defend you know, the wetware. If it was like the theorists were defending the human. It would be, certainly for a Nietzschean or a post-Nietzschean, it would be no go. Some, some of the theorists have announced the death of the human well before VR machines came into being. But do you not think there's also this real <coughs> collapse of the distinction between so-called theory and so-called practice anyway? I mean, if you're thinking about writing, performance, all things which theorists supposedly really do do. And adding Catherine Richards' comment about critical distance, the critical distance has obviously traditionally been so necessary to do theory. Do you not think that that whole distinction is up for grabs anyway now? It depends completely on the framework of enunciation. I mean, I was talking to Trudy about trying to put in a PhD grant on this kind of technology. You try to, to just Maybe jacking in works for the grant commissions. I can see the university, an eminent early 19th century institution that still believes in the metaphysics of substance, the university will go insane with the idea that you're doing some teledidonic, whatever, and it's, it's, they, we can't even pronounce it. Um, so I think framework of enunciations and careful um, negotiations, but at, uh, certainly in terms of the kind of language that is at stake, the language of, of uh, institutions, the language of theory is still linear. It's still, it's, it's very difficult to get out of the Aristotelian mode. A sentence has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's why Lacan was right when he said, for as long as you believe in grammar, you believe in, in, uh, in God. Now, when you read cyberpunk stuff, these people are thinking along parallel lines. There are three sentences going on with four different axes of syntactical meaning at the same time. They're thinking in a totally different manner. Mm -hmm. and there is no way in which a cyberpunk novel can be translated into um, <laughs> easily translated into um, language of theory. It requires a return to linearity, a return to mono uh, discourses. We could get into the work of Gilles Deleuze and see how he tries to cope with this. But, but there is multiplicity and complexity on the one hand, and then the language of theory that comes in with little building blocks. And, and that's, for me, a major problem. So 